Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our Hard Histories Book Talk with Dr. Lawrence Jackson. My name is Kendra Grissom, and I am a second year PhD student in the Department of History here at Johns Hopkins. Launched in fall 2020, the Hard Histories at Hopkins project examines the role that race and racism and discrimination have played at Johns Hopkins. Blending research, teaching, public engagement in the creative arts, Hard Histories aim to engage our broadest communities at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore in a frank and informed exploration of the myths that have become part of our university's story and to offer evidence of how race and racism have shaped Johns Hopkins. In spring 2022, we are hosting a series of conversations exploring the histories of blackness, slavery, and racism in the Maryland area and beyond. Today, we are thrilled and honored to host a book talk with Dr. Lawrence Jackson featuring his book, Shelter, A Black Tale of Homeland, Baltimore, which has just come out this month from Grey Wolf Press. Dr. Jackson is a biographer, critic, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of English and History at Johns Hopkins University, and is the founding director of the groundbreaking Billie Holiday Project for Liberation Arts. Jackson's work has appeared in Harper's Magazine, N Plus One, and Best American Essay. Shelter is a memoir in which Jackson recounts his experiences returning to his hometown of Baltimore as a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor. In Shelter, Jackson explores the university's troubled relationship with the city of Baltimore and its residents. He also recounts his attempts to navigate the, that relationship in his new position, all while establishing a home life for himself and his children. Dr. Jackson will be in conversation with Hard History's project director, Dr. Martha S. Jones. Dr. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Preve Presidential Professor, Professor of History, as well as a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. She directs the Hard Histories at Hopkins Project. Dr. Jackson will read from his new book, then he will be in conversation with Dr. Jones, and then we'll turn to your questions. In-person attendees will have the opportunity to raise their hands to ask questions during the Q&A. Virtual attendees can submit their questions at any time using the webinar's Q&A function. Finally, for those who would like to access live captions, they can be found online at the URL on the screen behind me. If you are joining virtually, we're putting that link in the chat. You can also access the captions within Zoom. Thank you for being here. Thank you both for being here. And I am now delighted to invite my advisor, Dr. Jackson, to read from his phenomenal new book. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I've taught a class in Maryland Hall before, though I wasn't precisely sure where it was on the campus. I took a rough guess went to the Trobe Hall first, knew it wasn't Shriver Hall, and then figured, you know, okay, it's got to be Maryland Hall. But uh, I've never been in this room before, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's quite appropriate. Uh, the room calls forth um, many of the things that I find uh, extraordinary and wonderful about my uh, American ancestry. And at the same time, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the ensemble is also um, troubling, or one that I often spend a great deal of time querying. So I'm going to try to read um, at a good pace. Um, I, I, I found, a, I think, an interesting tidbit for you, and uh, hopefully it will end at a place that also makes sense. Um, so the book is called Shelter, and uh, it, uh, it, it covers about three years of my uh, return to Baltimore. So it's roughly, you know, sort of second half of 2016 through um, early 2020, about. And uh, this is my front door on the cover. Um, and uh, that was a project, a house project. And the chapter that I'm reading from is technically, it would be chapter six, though we don't have uh, the table of contents numbered out. It uh, corresponds more so to the, um, uh, uh, the Christian uh, celebratory year. And so the, um, the, the holiday that's being celebrated in this chapter is Pentecost, or White Sunday was one of the older terms for it. And there are two epigraphs that begin the chapter, which also has the, um, the Carol uh, Mansion as its uh, frontispiece. Um, and so the first one is from Mungo Park. A son considers it as incumbent on him from a just sense of filial obligation to become the avenger of his deceased father's wrongs. 
If a man loses his life in one of those sudden quarrels which perpetually occur at their feast, when the whole party is intoxicated with mead, his son, or the eldest of his sons, if he has more than one, endeavors to procure his father's sandals, which he wears once a year on the anniversary of his father's death until a fit opportunity offers of revenging his fate. And the second epigraph is from uh, Waverly by Walter Scott. As if an invasion of African Negroes were armed to change the fate and alter the destiny of the British kingdoms. And so the chapter is called White Sunday, an invasion of African Negroes. In my first year teaching at Homewood, I would fish for a parking spot on the southwestern edge of the campus. At the northern end of the Wyman Park Dell, before gaining the school, I would encounter a statue with lingering words. Their repetition was a sound that became a medium, like a diaphanous gauze which filtered and reoriented meaning. While the entire pedestal was home to a long quote, the face of it contained a starred summary, a quotient, purpose so great. It is a lyrical refrain, much like Marlon Brando's movie line, The Horror from Apocalypse Now, the first R-rated film I ever saw. Francis Ford Coppola's homage to Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The chorus, Purpose So Great, will become a haunting refrain during my interludes on the campus, a chiding, Hertzian epistrophe as I pad the lawns and bricked paths. In my second year, the mayor of Baltimore orders the statue and another older monument on the north side of Homewood removed. It is feared that riots will break out amongst the citizens after platoons of armed men, some pranksters and some lunatics, have staged a huge white pride rally in Charlottesville, a preserve of America's colonial past. For an undisclosed sum, the mayor hires a construction company to tackle the bronze horsemen with cranes. The statues went up in 1948, when the father of Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi was mayor, a public cenotaph undoubtedly appeasing the Democratic voters tempted to bolt over to Dixiecrat presidential candidate, the raunchy Strom Thurmond. The President of the United States publicly laments the beauty that is being taken out of our cities. The horsemen are Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson in their final council on the battlefield at Chancellorsville, where Lee executed one of military history's most daring feats dividing his army and sending the stern schoolmaster Jackson to flank the Union Army and win the battle that was the predicate of their hubris and greatest defeat at Gettysburg. Purpose so great. To a city native, there are oracular benefits to bona fide membership in the campus community. Fittingly, the experience of these benefits is structural. The school plays a role in the revival of the built environment along Charles and St. Paul Streets, the university has handsomely refitted a film and media studies building directly across the street from what was once a historic nightclub called Odell's, a place of love's fantasy, legendary music, wanton inebriation, and naturally, since it's Baltimore, deep sadness that catered to the needs of a generation during the final quarter of the 20th century. Well, no one who came of age between the second half of the 1970s through the end of the 20th century will reflect upon Pennsylvania Avenue as the cornerstone of what the city had to offer in nighttime conviviality, tens of thousands of true blue Baltimoreans will happily recall Odell's and the bundle of nightclubs near the intersection of North Avenue and Charles Street. The club's motto etched on a checkerboard black and white awning over the main entrance, which can even be seen on throwback t-shirts was, Odell's, you know if you belong. Besides one eventful New Year's, when Flint's Ready for the World perform, my homeboys and I did most of our belonging on the street outside the club. Shootings and narcotics trafficking and other scandals closed Odell's before I finished college. So I am impressed to see the sacred geography somewhat revived with a new cornerstone that includes other local colleges. The shuttle stops on either side of Odell's Boulevard. Permission to ride the shuttle itself is a chaotic, tangible pleasure from belonging to this community. The bus runs every 15 minutes from the Homewood campus downtown to Mount Vernon or Washington Square, where stands the oldest American monument to George Washington, recounting the episode that made him genuinely significant, his resigning his generalship in Annapolis, a scene replicated in a painting at the Annapolis State House 
and in a mural in the cupola of the U.S. Capitol. Purportedly, the, mo the moment embodies the principle of American democracy, which would be disinterest, putting the community above the individual. The shuttle takes students from Homewood to the Peabody Conservatory and then over to the medical school and hospital, all distinct neighborhoods in Baltimore. Whenever I get on the shuttle, I find a seat and open a book and enjoy the unhurried bliss. On the upper route, the Hopkins shuttle passed two theaters that have been reconditioned with university, public, and philanthropic dollars and are made available to the academic communities. To my mind, the theaters have been more of an eyesores for 40 years. Obviously, it is gentrification, but one that has been so expertly half-hearted and taking so many decades to unfold that it is hard to argue with. Nonetheless, gentrification has an invariable logic in a city like mine where, as Fanon once wrote, to be rich is to be white and to be poor is to be black. The criminalized black poor are removed and the rich white citizens move in. The university I joined is already conscious of the ugliest of these dichotomies and has taken steps to revise its relationship to what's left of the black city. While there is an obvious doctrinaire formulaic residue that seems about as nuanced as Mao's great leaps forward, the initiatives underway extend far beyond the schemes of other universities I've worked for and attended. On their best days, these institutions operated as title holders whose obligations to their serfs relative to their larger economic footprint in their territories was simply a full board at the annual pageant. I cannot recall the largest public universities, I'm sorry, the largest private universities in Palo Alto, California, or Atlanta, Georgia, doing even that much. The new day at Hopkins includes not infrequent conversations with top administrators on matters of social and economic equity, and the university's proposal to address the serious legacy of racism in the city. When one of my books was published, the president sent me a bottle of champagne. I preserve it in a corner cupboard for satisfaction at the right moment. Usually I disembark from the shuttle at the Mount Vernon stop, home to the Peabody campus. Built up during the 1820s and untouched by the 1904 fire, it is one of Baltimore's oldest existing neighborhoods. Mount Vernon boasts distinctive federal style row houses and a square of Victorian neo-Gothic churches an art gallery, a music conservatory, and mansions spoked along a cobblestone esplanade. There are four gardens in the roundabout, and while I don't frequent them, I daydream in the vicinity whenever I have the chance. A new bike lane beginning in Roland Park and constructed because an inebriated Episcopal bishop ran down a cyclist there, takes riders straight down Maryland Avenue to Mount Vernon with few stops, a swift downhill jaunt descending a rider 400 feet from the heights of homeland to sea level. In high school, there were people my age who already recognized the similarities between this part of the city and elegant Bohemia. But I was then far more enchanted by the new to me suburbs and their bike paths, their fertilized lawns for leisurely ball games, and the shopping malls filled with polo shirts. I suppose my happiness with the conveyance has something to do with finding a new neighborhood pleasure later in life. I can sip a coffee on a sidewalk in Mount Vernon and enter a reverie of memory of the European cities I have visited and the books I have read and the films I have seen about them. Although the bus access is restricted to students and staff, the drivers, all of them black, are directed never to ask for identification. A plausibly free bus running on a regular schedule is a strong civic joy to me though to avail oneself of the privilege rests upon either insider knowledge or unusual boldness. But once on board, the bus is very nearly a mobile sanctuary through the urban landscape, a place of refuge affording an opportunity for serene repose. What's more, driving and parking have always signaled consumption for me. Because my father always selected inconvenience over fee when I was a child, my instinct is to regard parking garages and metered spaces as wasteful luxuries. To avoid the parking woes of any location in the central city, I ditch the car and take my lads to the shuttle. Nathaniel has taken the bus to summertime athletic practice in Towson, and Mitchell takes the subway from College Park to Decatur in Atlanta, but neither have been with me long enough in the busy city to become competent traffic dodgers or double yellow line idlers. 
Sometimes I, the boy, will sourly refer to a textbook rule about a crosswalk or a light while I'm trying to usher them through the fluid, risky street maze. Once when a street festival closed down the regular shuttle stop, a wild driver opened her doors in the middle of moving traffic so that Mitchell and I could weave through rush hour and board. Shazam, the double doors opened for us in the middle of North Avenue and St. Paul. After generations of industrialists, urban designers, and politicians eviscerated mass transportation to empower the automobile, new city planners have organized a system that caters to people coming from the northern boroughs into the old town with books in their laps. In Baltimore, there is free transportation if you use certain city corridors, and also a hassle-free 10-mile straight line rail from Hunt Valley, the town with few blacks north of Cockeysville, to the airport south of the city that also has a station at the athletic arenas. Payment aboard the light rail, incredibly, is done according to the honor system. Charm City. <laughs> Charm City Circulator and Light Rail linked together are examples of efficient, low-cost transportation designed to reward suburban consumers, making their way along the city's oldest commercial precincts. In the year before I returned to Baltimore, the governor, Larry Hogan, canceled a red line subway projected to connect the black suburb Woodlawn and the rest of the city's sizable black western population with the region's best opportunities for career growth. Johns Hopkins' sprawling new Bayview Medical Facility at Baltimore's Eastern Edge. The state squandered $450 million of planning dollars and left on the table $2 billion offered by the federal government. The bus is like a transition zone between the precarious and the secure, and I have seen its thresholds bending in both directions. In high school, I remember watching a boy racing to get aboard the bus to escape a resolute gang. Either the traffic light or the driver were against him. The ruffians pried his fingers from the door and pulled him down to the sidewalk and administered a thorough beating. If only he had made it beyond the coin drop box. The free shuttle affords me mental elasticity, releasing me from the rigidity of the clock and the burdens of the automobile. I ride whenever I can and I try to connect my classes to Peabody and the nearby Maryland Historical Society, less of a favored destination because it requires an entrance fee, but only two blocks away. The students and their world of a transferable, ubiquitous, digitally swiped ledger of credits and debits prefer Uber and Lyft and the newfangled electric scooters. But I hold on to my ancient ways. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, I do think it was um, apt for this crowd and for this room, um, but it's also apt because I think it captures the ways in which there are so many ways to find your own way as a reader um, into this book. It's extraordinary. Um, I have to comment on the monuments that sort of open this particular reading and the removal of the monuments. Um, in part because it was just last Friday, um, we unveiled uh, a uh, Candy Wiley um, monument of sorts on this campus as a sort of clap back to the empty, now the vacant plinths where the monuments um, once were. Um, I know you've thought a lot about the process of naming and the possibility of naming. Um, would it be too much to ask you to say something about what you think should happen with those vacant plinths um, as they sit today, sort of beckoning mm. us, um, provoking us, um, maybe even um, engendering our lament. Mm. Um, mm. I often feel like I've answered uh, uh, successfully more difficult questions about books that I uh, have only read uh, rather than books that I have written. And um, in some ways, I, I think that's sort of an adjacent kind of question. I mean, what to do with these uh, yawning gaps that, you know, I mean, represented one thing, maybe represented something else. I mean, had a particular kind of intentional purpose. At one moment, you know, I make the gesture to the Dixiecrat party, 
and the election of 1948, and it seems as if we will be reliving um, presidential contests similar to 1948 again and again and again. And perhaps that's healthy because that's actually the country that we live in, that uh, Henry Agar Wallace would be running far left and that uh, Strom Thurmond would be running far right. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one time it'll be Wallace, um, certainly seems as, as if it has been Strom Thurmond. Um, as, as for, you know, directly, you know, what should go there, um, I have a, um, a mechanically impoverished creative sense. So, you know, on the one hand, I'm sort of like, why are we obsessed with the, with the plinth-based monument? And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a, a cogent and sophisticated response to Wiley's statue. I don't know why we're still obsessed with the, the horseback figure or why that has to be a particular kind of touchstone. Uh, seems to me that there you know, could be other you know, sort of adequate, it doesn't have to be a substitution, uh, a moment for reimagination. However, uh, in the absence of, uh, you know, sort of a suitable uh, 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 substitution, I, I guess I think that I would like to see um, the classic civil rights figures uh, properly memorialized. And in Baltimore City, I feel like, you know, it really has to be um, Clarence Mitchell. And I've said this a couple of times in a couple of different contexts. Um, I am sitting in Johns Hopkins and, you know, uh, purchased a house in Homeland, um, you know, as a direct result, really, of, you know, a series of, uh, of legislative acts and judicial decisions that are um, owed, I mean, uh, you know, I guess in my view, really, by and large, to, you know, sort of Clarence Mitchell and his work as the, you know, they called him the 101st senator, I mean, the person who represented the NAACP in Congress, the one, not a one person, but I mean, you know, the lobbying arm of the NAACP that that uh, advanced the legislation. And uh, this is somebody that grew up on Carrollton Avenue and Lafayette Square where I hold my annual concert or the Billy Holiday Center has its uh, annual jazz concert and who uh, needs to be at the center of our efforts of what we think about what the city has stood for and ways to connect to the other figures. And I mean, you know, this is also the city of Billy Holiday and Frederick Douglass. Um, Billy Holiday performed at the Royal Theater um, maybe most famously in uh, 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 October of 1945 on both sides of her mother's passing, um, Sarah Julia Harris, uh, you know, born in Pigtown, uh, raised in Baltimore, you know, I mean, she's buried in, in New York today, but uh, a true blue, genuine Baltimorean. And, um, you know, there's no reason why we don't um, pursue a uh, marvelous uh, rendering of uh, Billy Holiday. My dear friend, Kame Murphy, gave me a, um, it's a large bookmark or a poster of a statue that they've just unveiled in Ellicott City, um, uh, celebrating the um, uh, a black member of the uh, Baltimore Elite Giants and, you know, um, one of the historic figures from the segregation era. I, I suppose that's, that's where my instinct is, and that's what's in so much of the book, Martha, uh, an attempt to think um, carefully, uh, lovingly, and respectfully about the generation that transformed the um, segregationist past of our country. I've always thought it to be slightly twisted that the city courthouse is named for Clarence Mitchell. It's a very um, provocative tribute, right, sure. to a civil rights great, um, sure. that place where um, mass incarceration sort of has its um, origins in, in the city. And, and uh, I might be mistaken, but I want to say he has a master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota, not a law degree. I mean, I, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, let me turn us back to shelter. Um, you know, I, I suppose um, there's an obvious answer to the question, you know, where does this book begin? How does it begin? Um, which is to say um, there is a, a figurative but a, a literal return to Baltimore. Here you are at Hopkins, here you are in Homeland. Um, but I was going back to read some of your earlier writing. Um, yeah, it's okay. Um, I was going back to reading some of your earlier writing. Um, and you remember 2009 um, Christmas in Baltimore, for example, that was in N plus one. Um, so I just wanted to 
I guess, open some space for thinking about um, how long this return to Baltimore has been happening for you, right? Because th this book tells a chapter of that, but maybe it's only a chapter and not the entirety of the story. Yeah, I would owe my creative nonfiction writing, the onus to that writing to, um, in, in some ways, I mean, just processing attachments to the city and then, I, I suppose, especially dealing with um, a, a background that is anomalous. Uh, whenever I ventured forth from Baltimore, um, I was always the uh, bearer of an incredibly unique experience. You know, it was a city that was not, um, it was either not thriving or not declining in specific kinds of ways. It was not particularly legible to other people I knew. It wasn't in the north, it wasn't in the south. Um, it was a, um, a city that was, uh, I, I would say, in a lot of surface ways, I mean, um, I can't think exactly what I would have done like towards the, um, the uh, first um, perch smoke mayoral campaign, but I'm sure it was something, you know. But anyway, on the surface, that would be, you know, sort of white, white run in a way, but then the people of the city, you know, I mean, were very, very black. I mean, it had, you know, could definitely be called a chocolate city. Um, but the writing for me, I mean, or one of these early returns really begins when my mother's house was um, robbed, and I was a student at Stanford at the time, and I came back, um, you know, just to sort of show a little support. Um, there were, it was, there were like a half a dozen things going on as, you know, always people at that age, I was in my mid-twenties. And I was, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, what's the, what, what kind of, of, of things should I do? I mean, you know, my, my father's passed away, my sister is on active duty, I don't know, I guess maybe she's stationed in Germany at the time or something. And uh, I'm on the other side of the continent, and uh, mom is here. And it was also at a moment for me, uh, of like of my cohort, neighborhood is very important to us. I mean, I think everybody knows this, like who's like looking around at Baltimore, like neighborhood means a lot. Um, since I went to a Jesuit high school, I mean, for me, like where you went to elementary school and junior high school is actually significant. And you know, you, you, those relationships um, stay with you. I, I was at an event on Saturday, and I looked up at a guy, and I said, man, you know, you look just like Michael Smith. And I know I haven't said Michael Smith's name in, you know, 35, 40 years or something, right? But it just sort of comes back to you, the person who was, you know, uh, I don't know, in sixth grade with me or something, or in the lunchroom, or, you know, we were playing baseball or something. But the, um, the, 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 the neighborhood ties, um, which are significant, and, um, you know, in my own case, were very strong, they were also beginning to unravel, or at least you know, sort of attenuate. Um, some of this has to do with the fact of the, the chronic heroin epidemic in the city for half a century, more than half a century, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't know the numbers of uh, service people who went to Vietnam. I would sometimes talk to friends, older friends who had served in Vietnam, and they would describe the, um, they would describe the, uh, not the admissions board, but the enlistment of board, what do you call it, your draft board, they would describe the event of the draft board as being one where the draft board was very specifically calling forth entire streets, you know, like everybody from Bell Avenue, everybody from Grantway Avenue, everybody from Bariva. Um, and so anyway, that population, I, I can remember this as a child, I mean, that population, you'd see guys in, in fatigue coats and they would be strung out, or I didn't understand them being strung out as a child, but you know, they're wandering around, you know, um, outdoors and a couple of neighbors and that kind of thing. But it became especially significant for my cohort, Martha, in the, um, by the early 90s, you know, it was sort of like people could no longer say that they were, you know, uh, enrolled in college or were, you know, pursuing a degree and uh, they weren't uh, thriving in, in jobs or careers or something. And so all of those things, you know, and I'm just sort of figuring out, trying to figure out, you know, what, what might you do and the, the response was, was a short essay, and uh, I, I don't know that it, that did anything at all. I mean, I feel like my, my mom is doing, is doing okay. Uh, I don't know if it made me more responsible as a, uh, as a son, but I did begin to think that that was at least, on the individual level, 
um, one way to respond to things that were you know, just very difficult to deal with. And then you mentioned Christmas in Baltimore. So I'm writing these elegies. I mean, Homecoming was the article that I published in the mid-90s about uh, my mother's robbery. Um, I, I uh, wrote uh, uh, another piece called Slickheads um, in Vernacular, you know, where I'm really trying to deal with, you know, where, where I was in the later 1980s um, when my uh, friend Donald Bentley lost his life. But uh, prior to the era of, um, you know, the cell phone circulated uh, duels to the death with the police, uh, another person that I grew up with uh, at different times I knew quite well. I can remember the last time that I saw him. I mean, you know, he, he loses his life under circumstances that at least to me seem to be incredibly, incredibly odd. You know, like why would somebody go to visit their parole officer and then five minutes later, you know, decide to shoot it out with the police? Um, but uh, uh, there are more people than Chris Shelton who have suffered a similar, uh, you know, sort of fate. But I, I I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, sort of understand um, the, the gradations of this experience, and then also I'm thinking very much about the kind of experience that my own young men will have. And it's um, sometimes I feel like absolutely out of sorts and a completely pathetic parent because, you know, I just I constantly <laughs> saying to him, you know, uh, I have a I have a very good friend who who has made like a national career by going places and putting up a chart and saying, these are the 10 things that you must do to survive the encounter with the police. And it basically is kind of like, you know, um, uh, 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 abstain or absolve yourself from citizenship. <laughs> you know what I mean? Be, be an abject supplicant to the police. And I enforce the same stuff with, you know, my young person uh, because I just, you know, I'm, 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 can be fearful at different, different moments. One of the things that made me think about was how um, a lot of us travel home in our minds, right, and in our reflections. But um, perhaps we managed to avoid ever actually returning home, and 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 that's a different qualitatively, right? That's a different kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. I I think that for maybe in some ways it's it's surprising, or it has something to do with with the pandemic um, that I was able to you know, sort of complete the book in a tidy way, or maybe some of the framing helps me get around a particular kind of anguish that, you know, I think um, might be easier to face when there is more physical distance. You know, I'm, uh, I'm very conscious of the, um, some of the uh, 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 stones that I have cast in the, um, in the book, and I, I, I would, I, I suppose that uh, there are often um, criticisms of, of myself, and as Dan Roderick said, I thought this was a great line, he said, it's not a self-indulgent memoir, right? You know, uh, trying to be, you know, sort of uh, honest and transparent or as far as that will go. But I think that um, physical distance from the home place, you know, is the, it, it's a boon to most writers. Um, it has occurred to me, though, as well, since I have been home, that I'm also like a fairly um, introverted or isolated person and that I enjoy my own company the best. <laughs> you know, and that, um, in other words, I'm often, you know, like the, a, a party of one. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps that also, you know, is another quality that enables um, the reflection to, you know, reach the point where I think, hey, you know, I want to share this with an audience or, you know, I've been thinking about it, I, I, if I'm in your train of thought a little bit. You are. Um, and, and we wonder what you're doing when we don't see you, but this is the book um, where we learn a, a great deal yeah, right, about yeah, what you do when, when we're not seeing you. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you, um, perhaps not facetiously, um, what's happening in your garden um, this spring, because um, we learn about your penchant for gardening, your um, preoccupation with home repair and home improvement. Um, that tells us a lot, but, but what is it doing in this book is what I'd like to know from yeah, your point of view. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the grain or the granularity of the lived experience and uh, different kinds of preoccupations, uh, hopefully some that have, you know, some kinds of uh, uh, metaphorical or symbolic purchase. Um, 
you know, this thing about the uh, living with the seasons, living in season, and then, you know, I sort of grafted the whole thing onto these seasons of the, of the Christian calendar and, you know, sort of these different celebrations and feasts. Um, I, I, I suppose, you know, the, 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 the honest or the most honest and direct answer, Martha, is that I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm buckling under the weight and I am giving in to uh, seasonal reality. I need the sunshine. I need the rain. Where's our rain? You know, it's sort of like, what am I, what am I doing? Um, I am, um, I'm also accepting the limits of, uh, you know, these particular windows of opportunity. And I used to be, you know, I mean, I was so cavalier about um, uh, when a, uh, a course would, um, well, I have the opportunity to teach a certain kind of course or what kind of material would be on the course or what sorts of things we might do uh, inside a class, though I have, I have my, my veterans are in the audience, you know, uh, bless, bless, bless the, uh, the, seafarer, the seafarers, the mariners are here with me. Uh, you know, we survived our journey. Um, and, and now I am, I am, you know, I think a bit more respectful of um, what, what opportunities time will allow. In the spring, um, you know, typically depending upon precisely what the weather is from the last week of February through the second week of March, I have, yeah, 21 days to plant um, uh, shaded grass seed in the parts of the lawn that uh, will only get sunlight before the leaves begin to blossom. And I don't have a 30-foot ladder to get to parts of the tree to be able to prune them. Um, if I bought the ladder, I couldn't keep it in the garage. I, I can't bring heavy equipment onto the delicate, um, it's like surgery uh, on my lawn, you know. And I have to, um, you know, force myself out there. And I, I enjoy the result, but maybe I don't have as much uh, discipline and will as uh, some of my betters. But I, I, I feel like if you, you know, drive past that you will see a, um, a, healthy, a healthy lawn, but one that, you know, has to overcome particular trials and w where the, uh, the caretaker has to um, submit to the, um, to the windows of the seasons. I have a couple more questions, but I just want to remind folks, um, there'll be a microphone here for your questions if you're in the room and um, your questions that are coming in somehow through the ether um, are going to show up on my phone. So I'll get to those in a minute. Um, you know, my grandmother would say about your, 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 your chores, um, you know, that's how she got closer to God, right? It was through the routines of everyday life, right? It wasn't in the sanctuary. Um, you know, it wasn't quite even in prayer. It was somehow in doing those um, almost routine, essential um, tasks that got her closer to God. So I won't ascribe that to you, but um, I think there's, there's something there for a lot of us. Um, so if there's one place in this book I'd like to ask you to take us for a couple of minutes, I think it's Lafayette Square, um, because it figures um, across time um, in really important ways. Um, I've been there um, on a I guess a warm fall afternoon for jazz, um, but you've been heading to Lafayette Square for a long time. So what would you want us to see when we visit Lafayette Square, those of us who aren't regulars? I just think it's a, a, a fine symbol for what we, what we could have, what's at our fingertips. I mean, it's, I think it's available to us all of the time or most of the time. And it's a question of, you know, the, the harvesting the beauty, um, harvesting the, uh, the mutuality. I've, I've been writing that a lot as I've been trying to pursue, you know, sort of the joint work that we do beyond the uh, campus. Um, a, a, a place for uh, engagement um, in some ways where the stakes are very low at least for some, and then in other ways where the stakes can also be very high. Um, you know, the, the beauty, the extraordinary beauty of the city's history, um, there is the ugliness of the city um, in history, memory, and alive and well there too. 
And I think that it all needs to be encountered and can be done so in just ways that will be enriching to the, event, to the, to the person who's participating. Um, I, I think for me, it is like um, almost um, like a kind of a, um, uh, a challenge to myself. You know, hey, you know, can you pull this off? You know, is it, is it going to be possible to, um, to have the concert there? Uh, and then it's also a place where I sometimes, or under certain circumstances, permit myself unconscious belonging. And I, f I found that to be, you know, a significant feature in, in my life and travels, just in terms of, um, you know, inner feeling and possibility, but especially about the kind of work that you, that you do. Um, I, I suppose, like, as a biographer or somebody who has, you know, active interest in biography, you're always um, needing the, um, the, the, the goodwill of s so many, you know, uh, uh, sometimes central figures, sometimes people very much on the periphery, and they have to have that sort of presumption about, about me, the writer, or the person, you know, sort of pursuing the intimacies of, um, you know, my subject's lives. And Lafayette Square is a place, you know, where, I mean, it wasn't like I was growing up on Arlington Avenue, but where I permit myself uh, because, you know, I mean, other than my house, um, you know, that's one of the earliest places that I can remember. And, uh, you know, when you're a child on the Easter egg hunt, I mean, that is the only thing that you are thinking about or focusing on. At the same time, uh, when I'm at you know my dad's funeral, right? That's the only thing that I'm I'm thinking about. Uh, I am I am connected to um, the geography in a uh, I guess like an like an like an edifice, or I mean just as as a part of it is what I'm trying to get at. So I I want to um, I wouldn't say that we don't have. Uh, it's low regulation, uh, you know, I mean, COVID gave us high regulation. I mean, you know, like we don't say that you have to master um, a, a certain lexicon to participate, but we do, I think we do, and we do a good job of sort of promoting a certain kind of etiquette um, so that we're all able to um, uh, participate in the exchange of music and fellowship and um, art and history as equals. But it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of thing I would like for us to claim, reclaim, proclaim, um, and to, um, to, to join in uh, our community here and uh, the community that lives there and um, the community that has historical belonging. And of course, that you know, goes back to um, Baltimoreans or metropolitan Baltimoreans and Marylanders over many generations. Uh, Lafayette Square is also the place, you know, where you had uh, the encampment of um, Union soldiers. Um, you know, we could do a nice, fine archaeological dig there, I'm sure. But it is a, an opportunity for us to um, celebrate the public commons. And I just want to be able to uh, participate in organizing and presenting events that encourage that fellowship same time, I think you, you're generous with us because you, um, with the book, let us see it from your perspective, um, which is a great deal more than um, the lovely Saturday afternoon that I got to spend in, in there um, listening to great music. Um, I'm going to do one more question, and then I'm going to turn um, to these. And it's about um, Baltimore and the literary tradition. Um, you know, Douglas looms large here, right, is um, my first sort of narrator, right, of life um, in this city, the place to which he um, arrives and then returns. Um, I don't know, today, um, I think of uh, Dee Watkins, um, but uh, our colleague at Hard Histories, Dr. Kim Gallen, has been working on the Baltimore Sun and the, the literary production. Uh, excuse me, I can't believe I said the Sun, because I met the Afro, um, the Baltimore Afro and the literary production that it comes through and out of the Afro um, in the 20th century. Um, I'll even mention ta Coates, though I'm not sure what kind of reaction that's going to get from you. Um, but I, but I want to, uh, can you say something about 
you all and this city and a, a literary tradition or how that tradition is and is not a part of, of this book? Well, after, and after Friday, I mean, I have to, I'm just sort of like, wow, you know, I mean, Anna DeVere Smith, you know, boy, um, it's such a, uh, such a rich tradition. I mean, I hope that I'm uh, a part of it and holding up uh, my, my end or, you know, the, uh, the salience of my own individual experience um, in that group. Um, I mean, you know, another, but it, I mean, you know, sort of like back to the, uh, to the point that I was making, I mean, Baltimore has this odd or can have this odd, neither fish nor fowl, um, you know, kind of uh, a, a, a geographical place in the arts or, you know, in, in literature, I mean, but even in the, in the musical arts where it's, you know, incredibly strong. In my class at, um, well, I, I mean, technically in, in the class that I was, that I was in uh, at uh, Mount Royal Elementary Middle School. Um, there was a guy named David Matthews who has published uh, multiple memoirs. Um, Janet Sarbanes, whose father was a senator, is also a, a professional, she's a novelist. I mean, she's a, a creative writing teacher at, um, um, in California. Uh, Tracy Hopkins, who, uh, uh, lives today in Brooklyn, but uh, was also a short story writer and journalist. Um, and so Tracy was here behind me, David and, and Janet were a year ahead. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there were other people, and that's, you know, I mean, that's one little public elementary middle school. Um, I, I think that in part, Martha, it is the, um, the opportunity that people have to touch on such a to marvel at the human experience. What Dee Watkins is able to do, you know, to, to, to my mind, um, I am in, in circles within the city, I mean, I am from an incredibly privileged background. Somebody was reminding me yesterday, we were joking about the, um, the nature of the Episcopal Church, you know, and you know, it's supposed to be the high church. And I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I I talk about how that might, there could be some useful dimensions to that in um, the book Shelter. But um, I would say, uh, you know, Dee Watkins and uh, Kandwani Fidel, um, it, we're, with, with some of their work, I think we're getting close to this thing that uh, we as historians, you know, we always say, boy, I wish that we had a um, testament from somebody who had survived Middle Passage. Uh, wouldn't it be remarkable to know what was on the mind of someone, say, from a Mende village who had been initiated uh, in an age group society and survived Middle Passage and the first five winters on the Virginia plantation? And wouldn't that be the marvel, you know, that would fill in so many of these gaps? And what do we have? Well, we maybe have something from the perspective of a small child who may have been born in West Africa, they may have been born in Georgia, right? And that's all we have, right? And um, I, I, so I would say uh, that with some of the latest um, writers, and I've never met anybody who is as motivated as Dee Watkins or as generous as, as Dee Watkins. Um, Dee Watkins is an incredibly generous guy with amazing energy. Um, but to, to be able to convey uh, Curly Street and, uh, you know, um, Monument, Street, um, that 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 takes something. I mean, I, you know, I, I, the the point that I made earlier. I'm I'm an I'm an elegy writer. I'm an elegiist, and um, it, so much of it is how do we deal with ghosts? How do we deal with trauma? I hate to limit it to that. I mean, we go back into our old debate between uh, Richard Wright and James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison, among others, but um, nonetheless. There is a, there is a core, there's a core dimension there in so many of the Baltimore stories. I mean, it's even true with uh, David Matthews, who was a biracial guy whose dad worked for the Afro, but um, uh, it also um, uh, seems to me to be um, thoroughly alive in the work and point of view. And I was so surprised. I don't know why. I was so surprised. When I was talking to Anna Devere Smith, you know, and she's, she is very, very reluctant. She's the one who made the joke about the high church, 
you know, she grows up in Union Baptist, and she's very reluctant to kind of um, touch too, um, too much on particular experiences. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain kind of bite and often a certain bitterness that is invoked in Baltimore experience. I, I you have joked with people uh, when I lived in Cote d'Ivoire, and I have a little bit of that experience in the book Shelter, um, there were very strong ethnic stereotypes among the major ethnicities, um, you know, I mean, but similar to the classic stereotypes that people have of um, uh, the major ethnicities in Nigeria. But anyway, the long story short is that there was one group, the Bete, and um, everybody would always say, oh, the Bete, all they want to do is fight. That's all they want to do. They just want to fight, right? And I've heard that about people from Baltimore. And I don't know. I don't know exactly what it means. I mean, I feel like I'm like the most mild-mannered person, as I said. When I'm, you know, my gifts to the world. You know, it's like I, I am. I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not getting blown up or getting angry or what have you. But uh, I, I remember uh, somebody was talking about the, um, the, the the state clubs and the city clubs at Howard, where you know people get together about what state they're from or what city they're from, and they were like, "Well, you can't have these Baltimore people go to anything because they just want to start fighting." Okay. So uh, it's not so long ago I, I heard you speak, and I remember saying to you afterwards, um, "Why don't you run for mayor?" Um, I, I'm, I, and I sort of meant it. Um, at the time, in a kind way, I mean, in, in, a, in an admiring way. Um, and I wonder, because um, the next question asks you about um, Baltimore's effectiveness amidst gentrification and ensuring black residents have opportunities to elevate themselves through real estate investment. Yeah. Well, there's a big question for, um, I don't know, a sociologist. Um, but you oftentimes come very close, I think, mm -hmm. to, to speaking in these terms, which is why somebody like me says, well, why don't you think about running for mayor? Mm. I, I, lo I love the writing, I, I, I love Shelter. I devoured it in one sitting. I recommend everybody who hasn't read it to read it. Um, but do you want to talk about gentrification and sort of how Baltimore should be thinking about real estate, vast swaths of land and more? Yeah, I, I, I guess I wish I had, you know, a, a a better grasp of it um, in a, at a macro level. I was having a conversation earlier today, um, this morning, uh, with somebody who is, um, you know, the stalwart person at the public health school and who was, you know, in the space of 40 minutes, just like running down every one of the, um, the major uh, uh, grassroots organizing groups and, you know, sort of kind of uh, Structural rehabilitation, uh, employment and training, um, uh, new healthcare initiatives. I mean, the thing that the um, mayor has recently proposed that I didn't understand was already kind of piloted, and that people will begin receiving, um, you know, the uh, the city grants, and that this is a national program that's been uh, installed. Um, I suppose, Martha, what happens to me. It, and I don't mean to, to sort of cop out as a, as a dilettante, but what happens to me is that I can read the newspaper and just become enraged. I mean, you know, like White Hot Fury, I'm the, the battling Baltimorean. And, um, I, you know, and I just sort of think, oh, you know, I mean, how can this uh, go on further? The other part of my own, you know, writing career was um, sending things into the Sun paper because I, I just couldn't, I, I, the, the, the level of, um, of street violence that we experience in the city, um, you know, I often think that it has to do with the fact that, you know, we just, we don't take youth recreation seriously at all. I mean, we don't, we don't think that it's meaningful. And um, that is certainly a portion of the dynamic of, of uh, deadly violence that, that breaks out in the city or that occurs re regularly in the city. But that was, you know, part of the way that I sort of began responding. I mean, I remember, you know, preparing to give a paper and uh, somebody was shot and killed out in front of my house when I was living on Pimlico Road. And I, 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 I just, I think that we, you know, wander into our corners um, over much or sometimes behind our bars uh, and um, are not, 
again, back this thing back to the commons, we're not, we're not interacting mutually um, enough. And then also where the generosity needs to, to, to be applied, I mean, how we can you know, sort of go beyond what's comfortable or what's easy and uh, make another kind of contribution that will you know, sort of change or make the difference. Um, I don't think that maybe that is a great uh, political slogan or uh, can't figure out an effective way to, to, to manage that. And then I, I also, um, I guess maybe what I would do best is hold the politicians' um, feet to the fire Though I am, you know, perpetually backing, you know, the person that I would think of uh, as the organic intellectual, um, you know, sort of in the <laughs> running for, you know, sort of elected office, and in um, in 1998, I think this is when uh, Martin O'Malley became the mayor here, and I was trying to help my um, cousin Charlie run a grassroots uh, campaign to, you know, sort of bring out the issues and. You know, it was another one of these things, you have these huge uh, public forum for, you know, 12 or 15 um, Democratic primary candidates and, you know, how could we elevate the discussion so that it didn't boil down to, I'm going to make the streets safe and hire 100 new police officers and that's the, uh, that wound up being the winning ticket. Um, it'll, it can be the winning ticket every time or it can be the winning ticket again. Um, you know, what do we do to um, uh, 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 fend that off or to prepare ourselves better for it? And so I guess I just have to, you know, maybe keep um, keep working on the uh, on the journalistic pieces from time to time. Um, it is it's interesting to me the way that I it, it just does not seem especially systematic. And I was I was saying in this, or I was talking about this, and I was saying that I hope that it's you know a, a beautiful work of art, like a uh, you know. A, a wonderful canvas that comes together with all of its different pieces interacting. And what could uh, come out of it um, politically, I, I would, uh, maybe I could think of that as, you know, a, uh, a, a short-term goal and I am trying to live for the ages or something. I feel like it was a terrible dodge, but that's what I, that's what I think. Uh, no, you know, like, I, well, well, I, well, then I'll save you because I, I think that, um, I guess the thing I want to say is as much as this is a book that is so steeped in the past, and we didn't even get to talk about the extraordinary research um, that has gone into um, you writing this beautiful book, um, but that there is something in it about um, a future, right? There is something, there were pieces of it to me, for me, that are really um, ways of thinking about our own futures, right? Our own legacies, right? That comes through very clearly here. Right. Um, but the future, um, that Lafayette Square scene, right? Which is, I think, a kind of future vision for the city, um, which is something the writer does. Um, and then the politicians do something else with, I imagine. That's supposed to be the moment of apotheosis, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. There we are, you know, in sort of Lafayette Square, and it was. I mean, uh, <laughs> you all will get me. Look, I start using that that Sunday morning language, but anyway, uh, uh, it was a it was a really it, they've been remarkable remarkable events. I mean, like picture perfect weather, um, you know, wonderful energy, uh, everything that we wanted to accomplish has been accomplished. The, the first chapter ends. In, in the irony that I also think is so uh, befitting, and maybe also, you know, back to the, you know, what you're asking about the, um, you know, these, these memorials, um, the ending of the first chapter is the, the destruction of the, the manor, you know. Um, what does it mean to desire this thing that's supposed to carry, you know, the prestige with it, to carry um, the, uh, the stature of social class uh, to convey, I talk about conveying, literally conveying patrimony, right? Being able to convey something to heirs. Um, but, um, you know, all that, um, everything that's solid melts into air, right? I mean, you know, at the conclusion of this, um, for this eminent Baltimore family, I mean, and, and you know, eminent in ways that are difficult, I think, for us to understand. I mean, eminent as designers and architects of the literal reality that we continue to inhabit. I mean, we're, 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 we're invoking them in absentia without, you know, necessarily being conscious of it. But, you know, their manner, too, was, you know, 
pulled down by oxen and um, you know, who, who knows where they are. It's in the Maryland Historical Society, you know, if you care to go there, and one day it won't be there, right? I mean, you know, that's just the nature of, um, the nature of things. On that note, I have to bring us to a close. But we want to thank you very much at Hard Histories, um, SNF Agora, Africana Studies, Black Faculty and Staff Association. We're really delighted for you to be with us, delighted for this book, and wish you continued success with it. Thanks so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for watching and for sending in your questions. We also very warmly thank the team at SNF Agora Institute, JT Bedford of Kit Kats, and Hiro Amano of Open Range Video for their support for this event. During these conversations, we have the chance to share what we are reading, but we're also interested in what you are reading. What sources have helped you to better understand the hard questions we are asking at the Hard Histories Project? Share them with us and help build our collective Hard Histories bibliography. Let other members of the Hopkins and Baltimore communities know about those books and articles that are helping you sort through the history of enslavement and more. You can reach us on social media with the hashtag JHU Hard Histories or at our email address, hardhistories at jhu.edu. We look forward to hearing from you and learning from you too. You can learn more about Hard Histories at Hopkins at hardhistory.jhu.edu. Additional information about our event series, as well as YouTube videos of our past events, is posted at snfagora.jhu.edu forward slash event. Please also subscribe to our Substack at hardhistoriesjhu.substack.com, where we regularly post updates about what we're up to. Thank you all, and have an incredible evening. <laughs>